looks like the first thing on our agenda is the presentation of the Golden Acorn Acorn Award. As you all know, we try to pick someone that has been an outstanding worker to give and have and hold and keep this thing forever as long as it doesn't run over 30 days. <laughs> Month of December, we have picked Mrs. McCallum. Mrs. McCallum, we'd like for you to come right up here if you would. to organize low and moderate income Arkansans around issues of concern to them. It has since grown to around 5,000 member families. The heart of ACORN is membership participation. Every family belongs to a local community organization which is affiliated directly to ACORN. There are presently over 40 such local affiliated groups. The statewide governing body is the ACORN Executive Board composed of elected representatives or the chairperson of each local affiliate. During the next 25 minutes or so, we are going to take a closer look at this unique organization. Of course, it will be impossible to compress so many years of history into such a short time, but hopefully a brief tour of the high spots will help provide some understanding of what ACORN is all about. The home of Mrs. McAllister, whom you just saw receive the Golden Acorn Award, seems an appropriate place to start our tour. Mrs. McAllister has much in common with other Acorn members. She lives in a modest, well-kept house in an older neighborhood in an older part of town. Her income, like 70% of the rest of the people in the state, is under $7,000 a year. Since she is on a fixed income, the problems of rising costs, from food to medicine to utilities are of special concern to her. She is also concerned about good government, especially about responsiveness on the part of public officials to the people whom they are supposed to serve. She is concerned about her grandchildren, the quality of the education they receive, and the environment in which they develop. Her ACORN membership is something very special to her, and she displays it proudly. But above all, since her life centers around the neighborhood, she is concerned that wherever necessary and possible, its values be restored, maintained, and preserved. She knows that cities are little communities of a couple of blocks or acres called neighborhoods. She and other ACORN members hold to a simple proposition. When neighborhoods die, cities die. Neighborhoods are our little patches of territory, patches where our children grow, where we were born, where we go to school and church.
Yes, neighborhood living has much to recommend it, but in low and moderate income neighborhoods there are oftentimes many problems, ranging from serious flooding, to abandoned shacks, to deteriorated housing, to inadequate and unhealthy drainage conditions, to road hazards, to overgrown vacant lots, to general neglect, and the problems of creeping commercialism. Often such problems are so great that one person with all the good intentions and talent in the world, can't do everything that is needed to find a solution. Mr. Willard Johnson, co-chairman of an ACORN group, is one man that has found that the power of people united can be a very effective way of getting things done. But don't make the mistake of thinking that the individual is forgotten in ACORN. In return for his dues, an ACORN member receives an ACORN membership card, an ACORN button, a bumper sticker, a monthly copy of the ACORN news, Participation in a statewide discount system of over 80 stores that offer discounts exclusively to ACORN members. Access to the ACORN Service Center where many valuable aids are provided to members. Including membership in a food buyers club where members can save up to 20% on their weekly grocery bills. and also receive some basic health services. But mainly what an ACORN member gets is the opportunity to work with other members and increase the ability to turn problems into solutions. It all began here in Little Rock in 1970 when an assortment of low-income groups that were organized primarily to deal with local problems, poor city services, housing project mismanagement, welfare grievances, and so forth, came together to confront an issue that was larger than any individual concern. 
They engaged in a six-week campaign of mass actions and negotiations, which resulted in the establishment by then-Governor Rockefeller of a million-dollar Furniture for Families program that was administered jointly by the Department of Public Welfare and ACORN. Not long after that, ACORN filed the first lawsuit in the nation to implement the new school lunch program. ACORN was instrumental in expanding the food stamp program in the state. ACORN successfully challenged the payment of excess school textbook fees that made the notion of free public education a joke. ACORN negotiated more reasonable deposits for low-income housing residents. ACORN was responsible for putting an end to some cruel and inhuman school disciplinary practices that bordered on the barbaric. ACORN became the first group in the state who had members officially registered as lobbyists in the state legislature for the concerns of low and moderate income families. The need to keep ACORN members around the state informed about each other's activities saw the development and birth of the ACORN News, a monthly newspaper distributed to all ACORN members. In the summer of 71, ACORN began a campaign that put the spotlight on gross inadequacies of emergency treatment at the University Medical Center. Special reports, actions, and meetings with officials, including Governor Bumpers, resulted in the creation of the post of a patient ombudsman or advocate at the medical center, whose main job would be to help solve patient grievances. At a time when rising unemployment coincided with the return of thousands of Vietnam veterans, ACORN began organizing unemployed workers and Vietnam veterans. The Unemployed Workers Organizing Committee worked to get a bill controlling employment agencies through the state legislature and was responsible for the actual shutting down of one establishment that was fleecing the public. In addition, the UWOC published and distributed thousands of workers' rights handbooks that explained the rights and opportunities available to the unemployed. The Vietnam Veterans Organizing Committee also worked with the state legislature and persuaded the governor to support legislation increasing educational benefits to Vietnam vets. The VVOC also published its own handbook that explained to vets their rights and opportunities in such things as jobs, education, loans, medical and hospitalization benefits, disability compensation, and insurance. This booklet was distributed generally as well as used extensively in their counseling program. It was around this time that ACORN really began growing and expanding statewide. An office was opened in Fort Smith. Early victories there included the creation of a neighborhood park and the establishment of a school bus system when ACORN members demonstrated by petitions, special reports, and a three-mile-long walk that one was needed desperately for their children. An ACORN low-income rights handbook was compiled on such subjects as fair hearings, work incentive programs, medical services programs, food stamps, school lunches, health programs, and housing problems and opportunities, and was distributed all over the state and, in fact, became in much demand all over the Mid-South. An issue dear to the hearts of all ACORN members is taxes. When it was discovered that a local congressman was promoting some loopholes for special interests, he was persuaded to change his mind by letters and a giant postcard from ACORN members. The national magazine People in Taxes summed up the effectiveness of United Action in this humorous way. in response to the growing frustration caused by the unresponsiveness of city fathers to serious neighborhood problems, real estate speculation, declining city services, insurance redlining, commercial zoning, and many others, ACORN began a massive Save the City campaign, a series of neighborhood organizing drives in Little Rock that 
produced six ACORN affiliated organizations and culminated in a large Save the City rally at which the eagerness of city director candidates to discuss issues with ACORN members was a testimony to the organization's growing power. something you should know. When a real estate agent tells you your neighborhood is changing racially and your property values are going down, then asks you if you want to sell your house, he's blockbusting, and that's illegal. If he won't show you a house or discourages you from looking in a particular neighborhood, he's steering, and that's illegal too. For more information, write ACORN at 523 West 15th Street, Little Rock, Arkansas, or call area code 501-376-7151. Thank you. Spot radio announcements by movie stars like Ryan O'Neill not for sale signs saying we like it here, and promotion of an ordinance to control real estate solicitation were all part of an ongoing campaign to impede the malicious practice of blockbusting that contributes to the development of slums and ghetto areas. Members of one of those groups organized during the Save the City campaign, Centennial Neighborhood Action, or CNA for short, were concerned about the lack of recreational facilities for children in their neighborhood. Noting the existence of an eyesore created by the demolition of an old school, they, through petitions, actions, and negotiations with the school board and city board of directors, persuaded the school board to sell the land to the city, and the city agreed to develop the land as a park. Unfortunately, just as the deal was about to be closed, the president impounded all federal money for park development. The people did not give up. First, they wrote hundreds of letters to President Nixon, urging him to intervene. Then they continued their pressure on the city, asking that revenue sharing money be considered as an alternative possibility. They won. The city, citing Acorn's involvement, allocated $85,000 in revenue sharing funds. And over one and a half years after CNA began, a park rises out of the rubble of the old schoolyard. Day in 1973, 40 Acorn members made a bus tour of selected national companies that take clever advantage of tax loopholes to avoid paying taxes. One good example was an aluminum company that had made $50 million in profits that year without paying one cent of taxes. The tour also highlighted the inequalities in the property tax system in the county, showing that well-to-do neighborhoods and businesses in the western suburbs got a better break on taxes than people living in low and moderate income neighborhoods in the central area. Acorn suit to call construction of the Mills Freeway came after every other legitimate alternative had been tried to get a hearing for the grievance of its members from the Arkansas Highway Department. Acorn first issued a scathing critique of the environmental impact statement prepared by the Highway Department, calling its scant few pages a self-serving justification for construction rather than a serious study of alternatives that would avoid harmful environmental consequences. The Highway Department's study certainly did not seem to justify the destruction of large numbers of central city neighborhoods in order to save commuters from the western suburbs three minutes of traveling time to their jobs in the city. The Highway Department responded with a heavy hand, rebuffing Acorn's bids for meetings in a way that even a local newspaper called arrogant. The debate involves many technical questions, but to Acorn members, the fundamental issue boiled down to a question of values a question of choices of whether you want to preserve neighborhoods and neighborhood values or trade them for a false kind of progress. Of whether you want to trade this or this.
to get this. Acorn was also making great strides around the state. In Pine Bluff, members attacked grandiose plans to build a lavish convention center with revenue-sharing funds, arguing that needs of neglected neighborhoods should not be forgotten. Acorn efforts resulted in the revamping of blueprints for a more modest building. Among other things, a survey was taken by Acorn members to determine the kinds of questions people were asking. Acorn members then visited city council and agency meetings and used every possible public forum to raise these questions. Finally, Acorn members organized a referendum petition drive to ensure that the wishes of the people were not overlooked. In the England Wright Plum Bayou area, Farmers organized into two acorn groups to challenge the proposed construction of the world's largest coal-fired plant, pollution from which threatened to damage their crops, property, and health. Using a variety of tactics, including asking for a damage deposit from the utility, organizing students at Harvard University, the company's major shareholder, and participating as a full legal party in the Public Service Commission hearings, acorn saw the size of the plant slashed in half and increased environmental controls added to its design. The activities of Acorn members in Fayetteville included challenging the fuel adjustment clause and other practices of the local gas company, and also the cleaning up of an unsightly and unhealthy landfill. The Stuttgart Acorn office concentrated on traffic safety problems as its first major campaign. Jonesboro Acorn members won significant improvements in drainage from their district sewer commission. Acorn was the only group actively opposing a 100% increase in sewer rates in Conway. In short, all around the state, ACORN members are where the action is. We already touched earlier on the $6 million victory ACORN won for its members in its campaign against the gas company. A candlelight protest before the Public Service Commission signaled ACORN's continuing efforts in utility problems. Members were arguing against a $38 million rate increase for the electric company and arguing for an equalization of rates between residential and industrial customers, since residential customers were paying nearly twice as much for their electricity. arm of ACORN that should not be overlooked is the ACORN Political Action Committee, or APAC for short. Its primary function is to interview candidates for local and state offices and report their findings back to the ACORN membership. Here are some members shown interviewing Joe Purcell, successful candidate for lieutenant governor. In 1974, the most significant accomplishment of APAC was the election of nearly 200 ACORN members to an effective controlling majority in the Pulaski County Quorum Court, the governing body for the counties. Fed up with the unaccountability of public officials and the rubber stamp nature of the court in the past, ACORN members responded in a typical way. As one elected ACORN JP put it, I believe if you're going to change anything, you've got to get in there and work for it. It was only natural that with all these activities and victories, ACORN would begin attracting national attention. The USJC's foundation selected ACORN as one of the best self-help projects in the nation after reviewing over 900 organizations. And the Southern Regional Conference, headquartered in Atlanta, cited ACORN as the outstanding community organization in the South for 1974. Let's hear what some other folks in and out of Arkansas have to say.
Acorn is just four years old, but is beginning to attract national attention after a series of successful actions that covered almost every kind of problem facing low and moderate income people. If it continues to grow, it could provide a model giving new meaning to local control. Fall our week in the New Republic. They have a stable, organized constituency, ongoing sets of programs, and great caution about windy sloganeering. National columnist Nicholas von Hoffmann. Acorn attacks on as many fronts as it can find. It uses the law, the press, public pressure, and private persuasion. Montalbano in the Miami Herald. In record in being morally and factually right on the issues it has addressed. Martin Kirby, Southern Voices. The name of its game is not welfare, or help for the unfortunate, or social justice, but power. Prodding people who never thought they could do it into going after the power they need to influence events that touch their lives. Austin Scott, The Washington Post. Every time we get together publicly with ACORN, we lose. A public relations official, Arkansas Power and Light Company. Other groups talk problems to death. ACORN does something about them. Mrs. Rosemary Nunn, chairman of ACORN's Oak Forest Property Owners Association. And finally, Harold Medlock, ACORN member, sums it all up. All the organizations are welded into one. All of our problems run close together and all issues boil down to one thing, group betterment. The philosophy is, I can, you can, and above all, we can.